Good afternoon. I am Anna Maria Luzardi, the Academic Director of the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center and a Professor of Economic and Accountancy here at the George Washington University School of Business. And I'm delighted to welcome you today to this episode of George Talks Business Series. Our guest today is Roger Ferguson, the President and CEO of the TIA, which is a Fortune 100 provider of retirement services in the academic, research, medical, and cultural fields. I had to read this because this <laughs> is a very important uh, um, institution, but also uh, we are so delighted to have you here today, Roger. Well, it's really my pleasure to be here, Anna. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm going to start with a question really related to this field, this mm. pension field. Uh, we have seen so many changes in this field. You know, we went from defined benefit to defined contribution pensions. The good news is we all live longer, but we have now to decide how are we going to provide for our retirement. And, you know, the retirement services and the instrument have changed a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about the changes that are happening in this field? Sure, absolutely. And you start at the, the right place, which is there's been a move from the defined benefit world to the defined contribution world. Um, and at the same time, we are living longer. Uh, and so the statistics tell us that um, in about 20 years, we'll have about 80 million Americans uh, who are in retirement. Uh, in addition to this increase in longevity, we also are seeing a, a decline in fertility. And so in the 50s, there were about 16 people working for every retiree. Now it's about 2.83 workers for every retiree, and soon it will be two for every retiree. This has a number, these two things have a number of implications. Uh, first and foremost, um, the move to define contribution means that we all have greater responsibility for our retirement security. Um, and secondly, uh, the aging population is also putting greater stress on Social Security. So we can talk about each one of those separately. Uh, in Social Security, what we're seeing is this year, 2020, I believe, is the first year where the uh, inflow from Social Security taxes does not cover the outflow for the benefits payments. And so we're starting to use the so-called trust fund um, to, to pay benefits payments. and by 2035, the trustees sell us a trust fund will be, uh, will be exhausted. And if we don't do something, they'll only be able to pay about 80% of the benefits. So that's the challenge in Social Security. In the defined contribution world, uh, a number of gaps have, have opened up. One is a coverage gap. Only about half of employees have access to uh, a retirement plan at work. Uh, and uh, particularly those in small businesses and minorities seem to have even less access than other folks. So there's a, a coverage gap. Uh, there's also a savings gap. Um, uh, my uh, friends, former colleagues of the Federal Reserve and others have estimated that we're short retirement savings somewhere between four uh, to seven trillion dollars. And I've seen numbers even bigger than that, so a very large gap in savings. And the third gap is what we call the guarantee gap. Um, very, very few plans offer the opportunity to have a guaranteed uh, lifetime income, a pension uh, in retirement. And so, a number of challenges that have to be addressed both in the world of Social Security and also uh, in the world of the DC plan. I'm glad you started with this very broad perspective because it allows us to then talk about many of these points. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with, uh, in a sense, one of the challenges. Uh, and uh, uh, GFLAC and the TIA mm -hmm. Institute are, uh, have worked together, for example, on the topic of financial literacy and the fact that people now have to make this decision and these are very complex. So can you tell us a little bit more from the perspective of TIA, why do you think financial literacy now is so important? Well, financial literacy is very important um, because there's a high correlation between the degree of financial literacy an individual has and the probability of having them live a financially secure life. Uh, folks who have uh, high degrees of financial literacy uh, tend to save more, they plan for retirement, they understand the use of debt and other financial instruments better, and so they end up just having a better, a better outcome. 
Uh, and so the issue of driving for increased financial literacy through all parts of society, students, adults, uh, different ethnic groups, uh, is very, very important to the kind of outcome that we all hope for for everyone in society. So because we are uh, at the university, I, I want to uh, ask explicitly, even though you had mentioned this already, you know, it's not that only investors need financial literacy, also students. Do you agree? I agree completely. Um, first and foremost, we all understand that there is a student debt challenge. Uh, for some people, it's a crisis. For others, it's a challenge. Um, and you know, a higher degree of financial literacy will help students manage those early decisions about how much debt to take on to pay for education. And then, um, obviously, as students get into the workplace, managing credit, managing savings, simple things like signing up for your retirement plan at work, all these things uh, are critical to young people, uh, both as students and then as early stage workers, even if they don't have you know, a huge amount of money, planning and, and, and using their resources wisely is very important. Since uh, 2017, uh, GFLAG and the TIA Institute have uh, issued and worked together on this personal finance index, which mm -hmm. really provides uh, a measure of the working knowledge that people uh, need to have today to make financial decisions. Can you tell us how TIA has used the findings of this research? Well, absolutely. Um, we've used the findings in a number of different ways. Um, first, we noticed that there are clear distinctions uh, between you know, the, the white folks who take the, the survey and African Americans, for example. Um, so the degree of financial literacy in the African American community is noticeably lower than in the white community. And so we have been focusing in in that space. We recently had a discussion uh, at Howard University campus here in Washington, D.C. about financial literacy uh, in the African-American community. Uh, we've also uh, been working very hard uh, with respect to financial literacy for young people. Uh, we have uh, a program called FinSites, uh, which is targeted towards students, uh, graduate school students. We developed it with the Council of Graduate Schools uh, and that is more of an online program that's now affected or touched about 4,000 students' lives, uh, focused on the kinds of issues that students have to worry with uh, and worry about. And so all of these uh, programs uh, basically uh, built off of the insights that we have from the PFIN index that we do uh, jointly with you here at, at George Washington. I want to continue on this point, also uh, acknowledging the leadership in your field to try to, for example, close the racial uh, and wealth gap uh, um, uh, between, for example, African Americans and, and white, and the, also the very large uh, racial gap that we see when we look at the financial literacy. And in this respect, what do you think uh, should more can be done, perhaps even, you know, you have done a lot in your work. What do you think perhaps universities and other institutions should do to really you know, start making a difference when it comes to this topic? Well, I think there are a number of things that universities can do. Um, but one of the things that we've noticed, and this is a broad societal observation, is that the uh, wealth gap um, is obviously heavily associated with an income gap. And if one thinks about um, the causes of the income gap between different ethnic groups, uh, a fair amount of it has to do with uh, entering and completing college. Um, we know that individuals who have completed college over the course of a lifetime can earn as much as a million dollars more uh, in, in lifetime savings than those who haven't completed college. We see, uh, even in the environment we have today with a very, very low unemployment rate, um, the unemployment rate for those who finished college uh, is about 1.6%. For those who haven't finished college, uh, it's, I believe, still above 4%, even when the overall unemployment rate is very, very low. And so an important element of closing these various gaps that we're talking about uh, is increasing the completion rate. Uh, right now in America, uh, about 90% of high school students have some exposure to post high school education, but only about 60% of people have any exposure actually complete. Uh, and so getting the completion rate uh, for college for post-secondary education I think is really an important step that colleges and universities can play 
uh, in, in their role of helping to close the income gap and ultimately the wealth gap. This is great. And, uh, you know, you have been a leader in your company, in, uh, in your field, and also t taking up uh, topics that other people perhaps uh, have, been, uh, have not seen, uh, I would say, from uh, diversity and inclusion and so on. And so I'd like to, if you could share some of the leadership lesson, uh, you know, in particular for our students. Well, happy to do it. Um, you know, I've been thinking about leadership for, for quite a while, and I've developed a theory that leadership really is about engendering followership. You know, if you, if you don't have followers, you're, you're not a leader. Um, you know, you're out by yourself, but no one's following you. And so as I was thinking about this, what are the traits uh, that encourage others to want to follow an individual? And I think there are four of them. Uh, one is expertise. You know, individuals want to follow someone who's got an, uh, an expertise. You don't want to follow an amateur. Uh, secondly uh, is the ability to articulate you know, where you want to go. Uh, if you're going to be a leader, the followers are going to ask, well, where are we going, uh, Mr. or Ms. Leader? Where do you want us to go? The ability to sort of articulate that in a way that makes it compelling and, and exciting, I think, is important. Um, the third thing, and I think this one is sometimes surprising, is I think a leader really has to have empathy, right? Um, if you're going to be a follower, uh, you want your leader to recognize that, you know, you're a human being. You're, you're not a cog in a machine. You're not sort of a piece in someone's uh, bigger plan. Uh, and then I think the fourth trait that a leader has to demonstrate in order to merit followership um, is what I call fortitude. Uh, we know that you know, the path is not always easy. We know there are curveballs and unexpected events that occur. Uh, and I think followers want to see a leader who is capable of responding to the uh, unexpected circumstance um, with fortitude, uh, with bravery, with the ability to sort of keep, in, in a smart way, uh, persevering and moving forward. So that's sort of the way I think about leadership. It's about engendering followership and trying to understand the traits um, that a follower would want to see in the person that she or he um, is, is going to be following. You know, your resume is unique in that you have worked across sector, you know, uh, including a governor and vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board, partner of McKinsey, and now CEO of TIA. Given that, uh, you know, we are in Washington and many of our students also, by the way, think of government services alongside a business career, what would be your advice to them? Well, first, um, keep that hope alive, so to speak. I think it's really important to be interested in and engaged in um, public service. Uh, my, my friend, the, the late Paul Volcker, is very interested in uh, public administration. So actually making government work is, I think, a very, very useful skill. Um, secondly, I would say if one is interested developing, uh, back to a point I made earlier, an expertise. You know, to be in government, I think one needs to merit the trust of the population because you have you know, sort of expertise. Uh, and then the ability, frankly, to figure out how to compromise. We are in an age where you know, compromise and policy, compromise in government becomes much more difficult. But given the nature of societal problems, the ability to work um, with others, to develop a path forward, uh, based on your expertise, I think is, is, is quite important. Um, and so it's a combination for students of the, the hard, formal, technical training, which gives expertise, and then maybe some of those softer skills um, about communication and empathy and teamwork that I think are, are important. And you really do need both at, at every level of government. Um, I want... I'm going to ask another couple of questions because while well, uh, I really want to hear about uh, an important advice from you, and then I think we're probably going to be ready to take some of the questions. But one of the things I really cannot prevent from asking is, can you give, given you know, here we have somebody with such an amazing financial expertise, so can you give some personal finance advice to our students? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, and I was very fortunate to grow up in a household where we did sort of informal financial literacy around the table all the time. I was not aware of what I was learning from my parents. Um, but I would say for students, you know, never too young 
uh, to think about and work on your financial literacy. You know, in, invest as much time in understanding your financial life as perhaps you do in your academic life, maybe in your social life. So your financial life is, should be recognized as an important part of who you are and what you stand for. Um, secondly, I've already talked about, you know, manage the debt and the credit side of your life uh, as well as you can um, uh, with a long-term perspective. Uh, and then the third thing is, as soon as you can start saving even small amounts, you know, 50 cents, a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, um, because if you do that at a young age, you'll get the benefit of what um, I think Albert Einstein called or others the magic of compounding. Uh, simply, you know, being young, you have the, the time to take small amounts and just through simple compounding have those be large amounts. So think about your financial life, think about managing debt, and as soon as you can, start saving, and even small amounts really do matter. You know, people often think, gee, if I can't put aside $3,000 or $5,000, it's, it's not worth it. My message is you know, $3, $5 grows into much bigger numbers you know, over time. Um, and so I really would encourage all three of those uh, disciplines as you know, things to learn. I'm so glad you are mentioning that because you know we are all looking at the asset side of the balance sheet, but one of the challenges today is also managing debt, mm -hmm. right? So that's, uh, I think, a very important uh, suggestions and consideration uh, from you. I would like uh, people to start lining up uh, for questions, uh, if you have, and I am going to actually <clears throat> uh, tell you, and I know you have done a lot on this area as well, that at GW, we are one of the few schools, I think, that offer a personal finance course. Wow, that's true. We offer a course at the undergraduate and even at the graduate level. And on that, I really want to kind of uh, thank our kind of dean and all of the school here who has recognized, uh, you know, this need. And we are, you know, we are having all of these new courses. So I'd like to ask you, you know, whether you think that uh, university, not just, uh, you know, uh, Earlier, I mean, of course, it would be great to have personal finance well before the university, but, um, you know, what do you recommend in terms of uh, having courses? And I know that TIA as well has been involved in kind of personal finance courses at universities. We have. We've worked through, as I said earlier, the, the work that we do through uh, FinSites, which is more of an online capability. Um, I, I think the notion of financial literacy uh, being age appropriate, you know, starting in, in kindergarten and going through uh, graduate school is perfectly reasonable. I mean, we should think of financial literacy the way we think about any type of literacy, right? You know, right. You're, you're learning uh, more and more about reading or math at every stage, and I think financial literacy is the same. Um, you, we've already talked a bit about some of the rudimentaries around, around managing debt and equity. As people get more senior, learning more about you know, equities uh, and the different types of investment vehicles, how to judge uh, both sides of the balance sheet and manage both, as you say, uh, very, very important. And, uh, one of the things I learned, I started, I guess, in the seventh grade, was the simple ability to actually you know, balance a checkbook uh, and, and fill out uh, a tax form. Um, and I'm surprised at how many folks can't do either of those. I realize checks to students seem like you know, ancient history, <laughs> those little pieces of paper, but nevertheless keeping track of how much you have in your checking account so that you don't over, overdraw it is very important. So I do encourage universities to you know, continue on the path of financial literacy um, and focus in on the topics that are really age appropriate and student and young adult relevant. Wonderful. I think we are going to start taking some questions, um, and why don't we start with the first one? Yeah, thank you so very much. That was a really interesting talk. I would like to go back to your very impressive career. So we are here very close to the government. We are in Washington, D.C. So my question is, what lessons do you take from your policy work as vice chairman of the Fed to your everyday uh, work now as CEO at uh, TIA? Well, the first thing uh, that I notice is that regulators have a very, very important job. Um, and, you know, we in the financial services sector, which is a heavily regulated sector, I think have to come to appreciate, you know, the value of really good regulation. Uh, we as a society understand, you know, what happens when institutions aren't well regulated. 
We've seen some cases where institutions uh, clearly went outside of the bounds of what's to be expected. Um, and so my view is thinking of a symbiotic relationship between regulator and, and the regulated industry is probably much more helpful as opposed to having it be combative. You know, that's not to say that you know, the regulations are always perfectly uh, tailored, um, because we know that they aren't. Um, but I think a recognition on both sides that the other side has a legitimate role to play. You know, the industry financial services needs to be well regulated. The regulators need to understand that a vibrant financial services firm or industry is important. So it's that. It's the ability to sort of see both sides and, and to have, as I say, a foot in each city, uh, New York as the financial capital, Washington as the policy capital, uh, and a recognition that there's value in both cities, I think, is important. Thank you. Thank you for this, for this talk. I wanted to go back to the retirement system. And given all of these changes, what do you think is the role of private and or public policy in helping people prepare for retirement? So let me start with public policy, uh, because of the public policy that sets the context and the framework uh, for in which private sector uh, uh, operates. Uh, we had recently an example of that. So there was a, a, an act that was passed and signed into the law towards the end of last year, uh, December of 2019. It's called the SECURE Act. And it is, uh, to me, a model of how the federal government can create a framework for improved uh, private sector retirement. Uh, the SECURE Act did a number of things. Uh, first, it created a bit of a safe harbor uh, for the use of annuities and selecting among annuities, so trying to respond to the issue I raised around you know, what I described as the guarantee gap. Um, secondly, uh, the SECURE Act uh, mandates uh, showing uh, the lifetime income, the lifetime income uh, uh, examples uh, of what income you can expect out of your pot of savings, which hopefully over time will incent more savings. And the third thing that they did uh, under that act was allowed smaller employers to band together uh, in multiple employer plans. And so it, it created a framework um, that would sort of guide and drive the uh, private sector to fix the areas that needed to be fixed. Um, hopefully, by having smaller employers be able to participate, that will take care of the coverage gap. Um, by explaining the income from a savings pool, that might increase the amount of savings and then obviously uh, help to deal with this uh, gap around guarantees. So that's a prime example uh, of how the, the public sector can incent the right behaviors in the private sector. The flip side is you know, the private sector uh, should then take advantage of and build products and services that are appropriate uh, to respond to these various needs. And so again, back to the point of you know, public sector and private sector being equally important actors in solving these big social problems. So that's sort of the, that's an example of, of how the two of them work together that was very real just a few months ago. Hello, thank Hi. you. Um, mm -hmm. So I was wondering for, you were talking about how students my age don't know how to fill out a tax form. <laughs> Are there any sites on which <laughs> students could learn or is it in your <laughs> financial course? Well, I, I would turn it back to your professor <laughs> here. Um, you know, unless I'm mistaken, I think the IRS has on their sites uh, very simple forms uh, and there are directions on how to do this. The way I learned actually was uh, in the seventh grade, I had a math teacher who the week of April 15th stopped the regular math class and took a simple 1040 EZ form, I think it's called, and made up a hypothetical family with income and savings and we filled it out. Um, and that was age appropriate for the seventh grade. There might be a version of that that's age appropriate for you know, freshmen and sophomores in college. So I'm going to throw that question back to uh, yes. Professor Lasardi. I, I wanted to say I'm very glad that, uh, you know, as you can see, we are getting close to April 15, and the students <laughs> right. are starting to be very sensitive to this. One of the things I wanted to add is that, you know, in our personal finance course, we do 
have an entire uh, lecture dedicated to taxes. Oh, good. Um, so, and you can also go on the website of GFLAG, the Global Financial Literacy Excellence Center, to get some of the information about, you know, personal finance decisions and so on. But this is uh, more evidence of how students are interested in this topic. Thank right. you very much. Thank yes. you, Thank sir. you for that question. Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. I, I'm not as, well, I, I like to consider myself a student of life, uh, but, but uh, no longer a student. So first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask a question, and that's a little bit um, different, uh, building on uh, actually some uh, conference that Ana Maria and I both attended uh, last week. Uh, and one of the big topics is robo-advising. Hmm. So we spent a lot of time talking about, uh, around here, talking about artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning and algorithms. And uh, so I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about uh, at what point or if we need to be concerned that the uh, entire financial advisory industry gets taken over by machines? <laughs> <laughs> That's a, a, a great question. I do have some thoughts on that one. Um, I think it's highly unlikely uh, that the entire industry will be taken over by machines, machine learning, et cetera. I think it's highly likely that we'll find you know, advisors working with machines to create better outcomes. So why do I answer the question that way? Highly unlikely because uh, savings, investment, financial matters are really um, matters of trust and confidence. They're matters of both technical skill and empathy um, and really understanding, um, not just at a superficial level but at sort of a deeper emotional level. And that's where the human connection comes in. Um, Having said that, there are a number of technical decisions that have to be made, and we know full well that machines are much better at identifying uh, patterns, at doing calculations accurately, um, and looking back and, and understanding the past. And so I see um, you know, AI uh, machine-enabled advice as being perhaps you know, the wave of the future. The other point I'd make is, um, and I know this from both my uh, Federal Reserve and economic experience, but anyone in this room who has ever done a model, a model might be very good uh, at understanding what the regularities have been historically that are exposed in the data, uh, a high R squared, a good T statistic, et cetera. Um, but it also creates um, uh, fixed coefficients when in fact maybe the relationships aren't so fixed. And so, you know, a downside to being overly machine dependent is regularities that have existed in the past may not exist going forward. Um, and so, you know, putting all these very important decisions into a black box construct where you don't really understand what the model is doing and what the uh, coefficients are could end up having, you know, false outcomes. Um, and the final thing we need to worry about um, and we see this occasionally in markets, um, is the so-called algorithmic trading, where you know, the algorithms, the models are all very similar, and then they all react the same way to incoming data. And you may get markets that become you know, more volatile versus less volatile because of, of you know, the fact that uh, traders all use the same algorithms. So count me very uh, optimistic and enthusiastic about the use of AI and machines and modeling uh, in the investment space, um, but also uh, count me sort of cautious, and certainly I'm a believer that there'll always be the human element as well as the uh, the artificial intelligence uh, machine learning element. Does, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Roger. Um, I would like to thank all of you who have joined us in person today or online, uh, and also tell you that we will continue on Wednesday, March 4th. Our guest will be Ras Ramsey, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Ramsey Asset Management. Thank you all, and thank you again, Roger. Oh, thank you for giving us the opportunity, and thanks for the great questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>